So welcome everyone. We are here for the panel Scaling Up NoCo, the ex Executing Strategies to Avoid the 70% Failure Death Trap. And so today we have an actually really exciting, prestigious panel I'm very, very pleased to introduce. And rather than not do them justice, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So we're going to start down at the end with Brian Clark. Hey there, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Clark. Uh, if you know me at all, it's probably for a site called Copy Blogger. It's about content marketing. Um, I started doing what we call content marketing in 1998. Um, started teaching it in 2006. We decided it had a name in 2008, so you kind of get the picture. It's <laughs> kind of been a long time, but uh, essentially what I do with content is use it to build audiences to start companies. And I've started around 10, um, I had three starter companies, that's what I call them, then three seven-figure companies, and then one eight-figure company that uh, was recently acquired in two transactions. So I don't have a job now. But, <laughs> which I do have a site called Unemployable. So I'm, I'm back in startup phase. And uh, I guess the interesting thing about me is I've never raised money. So if you wanna hear how to build scalable companies without necessarily raising money, I would be the guy to talk to. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm the CEO of App It Ventures. We do custom software development. Uh, so the history of App It, we've been around since uh, 2012 in earnest. Um, our, the foundation of our company is built on serving entrepreneurs. So today what we do is we really help entrepreneurs in the early stage that are looking to build tech companies. We help with prototyping, requirements, gathering, budgeting, all of that. And kind of our latest thing that we've been working on is um, helping entrepreneurs get smart when they're going for fundraising. Um, so just helping them close the gaps when they're building out their pitch and then kind of introducing them to our investor community. So that's what we're doing these days. Um, and then we're going through our own uh, scale up. We've, uh, we've experienced massive growth in the past couple of years. So um, happy to share some of my my battle wounds with you. <laughs> Before you let go of that mic, will you also mention Women in Tech? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm also the founder of uh, Denver Women in Tech. Um, actually, as of publication, I, we were at 1,200. I think we're at 1,500 members now. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of that group. Um, it's, it's nice to get around uh, a group of women um, and, and really work on professional development um, and network and, um, I don't know, just, just help out uh, in the industry a little bit. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of that work. So, yeah, we have monthly meetups and all that good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm standing here because we all got together and decided if we made Amanda stand, it would look really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Doyle Alby. I have an agency, MAPR. Uh, we have an office here. We have one in Boulder. We have one in Denver. And we work with a lot of startup and scale-ups. And, and as Brian said, entrepreneurs, I, I kind of like to think that everybody we work with, regardless of size, every company started someplace. They didn't just come out of the womb being huge. And so it's, it's a lot of fun to, to go through those steps with entrepreneurs and also to kind of work with uh, the larger companies and remind them what it's like to be an entrepreneur and to bring that spirit back to to serving customers that way as well so okay. oh, we can stay here. Yep. hi welcome and thanks for coming my name is Chuck McCoy I'm a, the senior partner at creative alignments and I also run our technology recruiting practice uh, creative alignments we help scale up companies build out their teams in four main industries technology natural food and beverage and consumer packaged goods um, ag tech and biotech and food tech, and lastly in clean tech and smart cities. Um, we um, have a very different, kind of a unique time-based model. Um, there's, a, there's a gajillion recruiters out there. We, we do it quite differently than the traditional model, and it's super compelling for scale-ups. And the last thing I wanted to mention, just that we've worked with um, scale-ups that have successfully exited, and that represents over $2 billion in, uh, in exit. So. Pretty fun. Thank you. So my name is Kyle Sickman. Uh, currently lead the business lending unit at First Bank. Uh, First Bank is a regional uh, commercial bank, about 20 billion in assets. Uh, the business lending unit we deal with 
primarily mature uh, lower middle market companies uh, who are seeking financing. Um, typically, that's a more mature company that will work with our type of group. However, we also oversee the uh, SBA portfolio for First Bank, which will be more of those earlier stage companies uh, that we assist financing there. Pretty new unit for the company. We started it about five years ago as one of the, the founding uh, officers who, who led that, and we've grown that over five years to about 500 million in assets within our portfolio. Um, so we've got some scale there. Um, when I started with First Bank about uh, 13 years ago, we were a regional kind of mid-size bank, uh, about 6 billion in assets in the last 13 years. We've almost quadrupled in size um, to about 20 billion assets, making us the largest privately held bank in the country. So uh, I can speak a little bit to kind of what we've had to deal with internally scaling as a company, as well as uh, some of the scale metrics we've had to deal with for our clients. Great, thank you. I'm very pleased to have you all here. And I think my first question for you is actually um, somewhat existential. Is it really necessary to scale, right? Is, is it one of those choices that companies have to make in terms of how big am I going to get and what does that actually mean in terms of how it changes the culture of the company, how it changes my life as a founder or a CEO, what that actually means in terms of being able to manage the process through that. So if you guys could just take a moment and speak to, is scaling the right thing for every business? Yeah, this, is, uh, this may be my question here um, because as I mentioned, um, I'm very good at starting companies and getting to a profitable uh, point uh, that's very lucrative for me and other owners of the company. Um, but I did start a company in 2010 that we scaled up to 65 employees and eventually to 10 million, 12 million, then, you know, we're in the low eight figures there for a while. And this was primarily driven as by software. Um, and uh, software as a service primarily. And these are incredible businesses that are getting easier and easier, even for non-technical founders such as me. Uh, for me, it was partnering with and hiring the technical talent that I needed. Now we're moving into areas such as no code where you're able to build apps much more uh, easily. It's, it's really a, an amazing time to be a creative entrepreneur, whether or not you can code or not. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and I always reflect back on the three companies I started before that were very lucrative, very profitable. I could have just stayed right there and had a great life. So why didn't I? Well, my own ambition, I let probably my own ego, you know, but the opportunity was right there in front of us. And so we just naturally took it year after year and we grew you know, from zero to three million to five million to eight million. And then next thing you know, you're up there in a range uh, and also 65 families that I feel responsible for as well. And I don't regret any of that, but I never wanted it either. And then so you, you have that David Byrne moment where you're like, well, how did we get here? <laughs> <laughs> and and it really was just taking mm -hmm. the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. Every year, it, the path seemed clear as to what we needed to do and it kept working. But we did hit an inflection point where, um, number one, you need a guy like Kyle when you get to that point. If you don't raise money from investors, um, that's fantastic for a while, but eventually capital needs will show their head. <laughs> they will raise their heads, right? And a good banker is key. Uh, and we did enter into those kind of relationships and borrowed, you know, substantial amounts of money and paid back. And then once, uh, you know, the first half of the company was acquired, we paid off uh, the rest of the loan and, and everything was good. Um, but even with that relationship, we found that if we were really going to go in the direction that we envisioned, we needed much more money than that. And that was really a crossroads for me, which was, I had three options basically, start scaling back, which is an option, but I didn't wanna lay anyone off. Uh, the next option was private equity, and, uh, or I, as I call it, dancing with the devil. And uh, <laughs> I was bent over for the kiss. I mean, I had the paperwork right there. <laughs> and, uh, and ended up making a, an unpopular decision with many people at the time and walked away from it. And basically I was like, the next five years of my life, my kids are going to graduate high school and leave 
and I'm gonna be buried answering to masters other than myself, right? And then the third option was to sell, and that's what we chose to do. But it begs the question of, did I need to get to that point in the first place? Not necessarily. Um, are any of you familiar with a company called Basecamp? It's also a SaaS, right? So Jason Fried and DHH, they rail against venture capitalists and hyper growth and growth for its own sake and scaling for no reason. Now, don't get them wrong. Those guys print money, right? Uh, and in 2006, they did take a small investment from a guy named Bezos, okay? But it wasn't growth money. We never made any requirements them to do anything. Um, so they're authentic in, in saying you don't have to scale. Uh, my friend Paul Jarvis has a book called Company of One. Uh, if you're interested in a different approach, that's a good read. But you know, if All right, Brian, I'm, I'm going to let you stop there because okay. I have a feeling you could give a master no, no, class no. in this fairly just, easily. <laughs> will call you a lifestyle business and it's derogatory, but that's because they're not making any money. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amanda, I watched you nod your head at a couple of Brian's points. As someone who's going through scaling up right now, what made you make the decision to do that? Um, Actually, my team, my team helped me make that decision, um, and and it was an honest one. I think um, sitting down with uh, my my direct team that that works with me the most, you know, setting a clear path for us was was um, really important for our team culture, and that's what's really brought about the growth that we've experienced. Um, and I'm nodding my head because the skills that, that got me to where I was, mm -hmm. where I was that lifestyle business, aren't the same skills that I need in scaling up. And so, um, you know, I started to change as a person, like who I brought to my team. It wasn't as, um, I don't know, steady uh, and purposeful as I used to be. And so when I did come to my team and, and just, we agreed, hey, let's, let's go for it. Um, everything shifted on our culture. And so now the goals that we set aren't my goals, they're my team's goals. And when your team is fully aligned on where you're headed, your customers feel that. And that's what mattered most to me. Um, and it's been a humbling experience. I mean, um, admitting that I don't know everything. Um, it's, it's a skill that you have to cultivate over time. And finding the right trusted advisors to plug in, um, to point me down the right path when I need to, it's helped me cultivate a new set of skills, um, but it's also given my team clarity, and I think that that's important. Um, there are a different set of skills in starting up than there are in scaling up, and you have to know that difference and be okay with changing. Mm -hmm. And I think your emphasis on the team, I want to come to Chuck here for just a minute and say, how is it that when you start to scale up, how do you start to identify what it is that you are going to need in order to develop that team and really recruit them into your business that you're growing? A couple ways, I think, to answer that. Um, one is, um, really understanding what's compelling and what's different and what makes your company special and really being able to communicate that out to the marketplace. Um, there's this idea of obviously uh, marketing and, and branding uh, that also plays in employment branding. And I think getting to that early enough, so you're not only sending a message about, mm -hmm. hey, this is who we are as a company, this is, this is our mission and vision and values, this is our product and why that's important, um, but also this is our culture, this is our workplace, um, and this is what makes us uh, a fantastic place to be. Trying to do that as early as you can, I think, can, can really help in that scale up process. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, um, skills and the talent that you need. I think those are pretty, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, I, I, you know, I've got to have, if, depends on the stage that you're at. If you're still in kind of startup or very early scale up, um, pre-GA, you, you really got to develop your product. So you're, whatever that product or service is, you've got to spend your time there. You want to s try to set the stage for, I'm going to have to market this product. I'm going to have to sell this product. I'm going to have to account for all of that uh, activity that's going on. So you have to build out your team across all those functional areas. Um, as you, if you get to, to GA, then you you got to sell it. You got to market it and sell it. So, so yes, you're still probably going to have some engineering or some development happening, but 
I got to do marketing and sales. That's my number one thing. And I'm going to toss on too. I think you've got to ask yourself what kind of business you are, and if it makes sense. At what point you should scale, how much you should scale. You know, to Brian's point, I mean, when he was doing Rainmaker, you could add a thousand clients in a month, and that was a good thing, and it was kind of not a big deal. I'm a professional services firm. If I added, if I even tried to add ten clients in a single month, it would be chaos. I couldn't do it. Um, and and you've also got to you know take a step back with your employee base. And I was just with uh, the guys at Laborjack, a Fort Collins company here, and we were talking about how every single employee that every one of us hires touches our client. And in their case, it goes to the cl- they go to the client's homes, they go to the client's businesses. So how they scale depends very much on how they can find the right people that are willing to do that uh, or that are able to do that, as well as being able to find the customers to support that growth. So you, you take a step back and look at your business too and don't think you need to grow certain kinds of businesses the way you would grow others. And I think, Kyle, I want to bring you into this conversation in saying what do you need to have prepared from a financial standpoint in order to be able to get to know you're ready for the next step, that you're ready to scale? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you're getting to that scaling standpoint, you know, it kind of goes back to where are you, what are you trying to accomplish early on in, in what you're developing and how did you fund that? So if you are hyper-focused on product development or research and development, um, you really need a, a big pocketbook of equity and frankly, you need to ha- know that you have commitments there to re-up on that because I find the more companies start to scale, the more they uncover the things that they don't know um, and the costs that go along with those. Um, and that is really, you need to have contingencies in place for those and some sort of set aside and allocation. So um, it, it's the banker speaking, but forecast, forecast, forecast um, is what you need to do and really understand as each once you kind of kick into that revenue growth phase, which I think is your, your scaling phase, um, do you have the operational components in place from a system standpoint to support that growth? What are the points where your systems are gonna break? And that's not just a capacity system from a technological standpoint, but how much can your people physically handle on a daily basis? And then those unknowns come in and. Yep. blow up their ty- entire capacity and, and those come with costs. And I think you've done a beautiful job of leading into my next question, honestly. What are the key things that you actually need to forecast and plan for in the future and then communicate to both internal and external partners? Uh, I'll, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll kick off since I have the microphone. <laughs> and I don't have a chair. Um, <laughs> you're gonna hear about that all night. Um, <laughs> I, you know, one of the most important things is to make sure that your team is aligned with, you know, if you've got in your brain or in my brain, if I say, I want to go out and grow this thing to, you know, X million dollars, and my whole team's going, you want, you want to do what? You've got to make sure that everybody is 100% aligned. And at the same time, that can go the opposite direction, too. As Amanda talked about, the team wants to go forward. Am I willing to to acquire the skills or hire the skills that I need in order to keep that business moving forward. So I think it's, it's, got, it's got to begin at its very core with a really honest conversation of if you don't have mission, vision, values, get some. Do you put your team in a room tomorrow and put them down on a piece of paper. They're not real until they're written. Ours hang in our entryway so everybody can see them. Um, and then really get honest with yourselves about what you want. And if that means a team member says, I hear you, but that's not for me, align the team because if you've got a couple people rowing even a little bit sideways, it's gonna break real fast. Amanda, what are you forecasting? So uh, when I first started, I'm a revenue driver, that's my passion. Um, I was born a salesperson. Um, it's a disease that I'm proud of, I think. Um, but you know, when I was uh, more, um, I was gonna say immature in my career, but earlier on in my career, um, my focus was on driving revenue at any cost, right? Because that's that's the spirit of a salesperson. And so, uh, before I started leaning on some of my trusted advisors, all I would forecast is sales. Um, and I I um, I drove toward that, and we hit that. And then I started looking around and seeing my team on the verge of burnout. 
and um, you know, being being in a, a C level uh, role, you. I think a lot of us, uh, we expect honesty. We think that we're just owed that, um, but you're not. Um, you have to earn that from your, your team. Yeah. And you know, these are all people that I've worked with prior, I had great relationships with, but I saw that they were burned out, but I assumed everything was okay um, because they weren't coming to me. And they weren't coming to me because they're, they're loyal to me and they didn't wanna hurt my feelings or upset me or take us off our path, and so um, and we reached a point in November of 2019 where um, I realized that I wasn't properly forecasting the need for employees. Um, and so what I did is I ended up grow almost doubling our team uh, within a span of a month's time. That's also a mistake. Please don't, please don't do that. <laughs> Chuck and, may have an opinion yeah, here on this Chuck. one. <laughs> Feel free to chime in at any time. Um, and so what I, what I learned very quickly was budgeting not only for sale or forecasting sales, but forecasting budgets and forecasting time. And um, w whereas I thought that I could do, let's just say there are 160 hour work weeks or work hours in a month, um, work weeks, and I, um, I, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, I, I had just, yeah, that's it. I had just applied an 80% because I was like, oh, you know, our, my team's highly productive, we're 80%, it's, it was inaccurate. And so I, I had to dial back my assumptions. And um, I'm a, a firm believer in data is the antidote to panic, and it's the antidote to optimism. And I tend to be about 20% too optimistic. And so using data to forecast sales, budgets, and your employees' time, you can't expect new hires to just hit the ground running as much as they want to. It's not gonna work, and your customers are gonna suffer, and your revenue will dip in the, in the short run. So that's why I'm nodding, because I'm like, oh, learn that lesson, so. I'm gonna let Chuck chime in, and then I have a question yeah. for Brian. Yeah, and I think just trying to set up a st strategic plan, that's a really important uh, piece of forecasting. We went through that process ourselves uh, tail end of last year, and, and knowing what we're targeting uh, this year, this quarter, you know, this year, next year, next three years, next five years, that's super important, and then communicating that to the team. So that's kind of talking around the buy-in and making sure that everyone's on board with, here's where, here's where we really want to get to. I, through that process, I was not a big advocate of, of, of doing that actually, but through that process, I came to realize like, it's okay if we set these goals. If you don't meet them, so what? You're probably gonna meet more goals than if you have that, that out there than if you didn't. Okay. So, Brian, huge fan of your newsletter, both Unemployable and Further, and one of the things that you talk about in there is solopreneurs scaling to seven-figure fit businesses. So, as a solopreneur, and we know here in Fort Collins that we have roughly 50% solopreneurs who arrive at Fort Collins Startup Week at any given time, what is it that they need to start forecasting as a solopreneur in order to know that they're ready to scale? That's such a good question. It's, I was gonna comment that uh, we grew to the point where we, I had a CFO, we called him the grown up of the company. <laughs> and, uh, and every time we would launch something new, I would design the product and I would design the launch and I would do the whole strategy and everything. And he'd go, Brian, give me some projections on sales. I'm like, Sean, I'll be glad to make something up for you, but I have no idea until right. it goes out there. And I always found that to be a healthy attitude because I didn't have any assumptions, even though we had a pretty good track record. Mm -hmm. And so then he would go to the banking guys and give them a number that he clearly made up. And <laughs> <laughs> Kyle's but, never seen yeah. that, never seen that happen. But it was conservative and we would beat it. And our banking guys were like, we don't understand your business, but it's awesome, take some more money. <laughs> um, from a solopreneur standpoint, um, I'm a big advocate of what I call an audience first approach as opposed to a product first approach. Mm -hmm. And all that means is instead of dreaming up something you think people want to buy, you would build a real group of people as an audience that you communicate with, you attract them with content or some sort of value, and you figure out more concretely what they would be willing to buy through paying attention to what they do, surveying, feedback, all that kind of thing and then your success rate goes way up. And then the thing is though, with that audience first approach, you've got one successful product or service, you still got the audience. They're still telling you 
stuff that they need. And that's effectively what we did for about 10 years. We launched a new thing every year and that's how you compound that money. And yet what scaled was really the audience, which is digital, and the number of things we sold them, not necessarily uh, until we got to the, ne to the next level where we had to hire a bunch of people. That's what I was saying. Those little seven figure startups that I started had no employees. It was just me and a business partner and some freelancers. That's a great business, right? And so with the audience first approach, you're able to scale your revenue without necessarily having to keep hiring more people to build more complicated things. Now, these are, this was a digital-based business. It's very different if you're bricks and mortar. There were some guys in the panel before who started a food truck, and I'm like, oof, that's a tough business, but I'm glad they exist, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah. that, Great. to me, is the mindset that I think can make an individual, a company of one, incredibly lucrative company without the things you think you have to have uh, meaning a bunch of employees and, and all of that kind of thing. So that, that's my advice. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. I really appreciate this viewpoint. It's not nearly as common as it should be in the startup world, I don't think. Um, and so when we're working with our clients, we, we really harp on finding product market fit as quickly as possible. And that's what you're doing. And that's what you're doing. And um, especially in tech, if you're looking to build a product, uh, you don't, you know, I, I kind of push back on the investment community sometimes too because there's a lot of noise about getting something in the market and just start learning. Um, you can actually get product market feedback through using a prototype or some type of survey uh, before you're investing a lot of money even into your MVP. So we work a lot trying to coach our entrepreneurs on First things first, build out your assumption. Let's let's get every idea that you have on paper. We'll, we'll keep a record of it um, so there's no stress there that you're gonna miss something. Start with a prototype. Survey more people than you know. So if you feel like you comfortably know 100 people, get that survey out to 200 people because you don't want your friends giving you feedback. You want strangers giving you feedback. Yep. And then the next thing, once you've gotten an idea of product market fit, then invest in your MVP and listen to how your customers or your users respond to your product. And we've seen way too many entrepreneurs, especially in our line of work, that just wanna go and start investing in the product and then get market feedback that way. It's an incredible amount of risk, um, especially in the tech side of things. So I would strongly encourage uh, the group to find a way to build out surveys, um, capture as much product market fit feedback as you can from people that you don't know. And then from there, you can build your marketing strategy that's actually in line with where your customers hang out, what kind of content they consume, where they consume it, who they hang out with, what are the products they wanna use, and does yours fit in that? And by the way, how much do they wanna spend to use your product or use your service? Mm -hmm. And I would strongly encourage you guys to gather that data before you start, because um, it'll save you some time, it'll save you some money, and it'll save you some stress. So I have maybe one or two more questions, and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience uh, for some questions, but I wanna come back to our service providers, um, starting down here with Kyle because you guys work with a lot of companies that are scaling up. You've seen a lot of different things, and Doyle, I know you've dealt with a number of them as well. What is it that you're seeing out there that are the really good tactics and the really good strategies that are really moving companies into that scale-up position to a point where they've got the solid enough foundation to scale sustainably? So, you're absolutely right. We, we probably look at hundreds of, of companies a week. Um, so we see lots that are obviously not great, but I want to focus on the ones that are successful, of course. Um, <laughs> There's value in, in knowing what doesn't work there, as well. There is, absolutely. Um, and I would say, and it's been true in, in our business as well as we've scaled, is um, know what you are um, as a company and what you excel at. Um, doesn't mean you have to change your vision or your values of, of what you are as a company. Um, but be willing and able to pivot where you find success in the marketplace um, and where you have trust in your relationships. The most successful companies that scale quickly and easily, they find the thing that they 
provide the greatest amount of value in the marketplace and it may not have been where they started. It is just kind of where somebody that they connected with and provide a service for really latches on and says, nobody else is doing this the way you are doing and that may mean you focus more resources there. Um, and you build that level of trust with individuals that you have relationships, whether that's be from previous things that you've done, um, and they're gonna come to you and they're gonna work with you as you kind of get through some of the growing pains as you scale. Mm -hmm. um, and they're gonna give you more business earlier on and allow you, provide you the resources, flexibility and payment terms, all the sort of things that you need as you're trying to build up your, your base. You need flexibility and trust um, and a network that you've worked with. So um, that's really where I've seen companies be most successful is Great. kind of those key points. Chuck, what are your thoughts? I think two two main areas. Um, one is you know, kind of the financing and the, and the money aspect. If you don't have enough money, you can grow your company, you can um, scale, but it's just going to happen much, much more slowly. So I think the number one thing is is kind of the, the money side, and that's the fuel for your growth. And then the second thing I think is your people. Uh, mm -hmm. And really making sure that you hire great people. I think um, Brian was saying, I, you know, I, I tried to do it every, I tried to do it all as a as an entrepreneur, and I think that's your mindset. But you need to change that very, very quickly, or you're not going to be able to to scale at a fast enough rate. So you've got to attract and retain and hire great people, and part of that is, um, you know, enabling them and giving them the ability to do what their specialty is that they're better at than you are, giving them the ability to, to be successful in that. So money and people. Great. Um, from my point of view, when, when we start to work with a company that's going from startup to scale up, uh, I'm gonna pick on my favorite phrase that I never wanna hear again my whole life. We're coming out of stealth mode. There's no such goddamn thing, all right? It's, it's, it, exactly. Like, you know, what are you doing? I'm in Netflix mode. I'm, you know, no, I'm watching television. It, it's, and it's okay to not, it, and I don't mean to say that you should be doing press releases from day one with your business partner in the basement, but, but it's, it's not so this crazy. thing that then all of a sudden, then what, what happens is companies come to me and the average news release, let's just put this out there, is about 400 words, four to 500 words is give or take a good news release. And you're going to tell somebody, what your market is that they didn't know was a market, what your product is that they didn't know was a product, what your company is, who you are, what your qualifications are, click, 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 in four to, five, four to 500 words. No, you're not. And then they, they can't figure out why the world isn't beating a path to their door. So I think one of the biggest mistakes I see is start to socialize your idea appropriately. It doesn't have to be a quote unquote press release. It doesn't have to be paid advertising. It can be, as Brian talks about, it's your own blog. It's using social media. It's building some, some networking out there and talking to strangers. Because your friends, as Amanda said, you know, it, uh, it, it takes a really good friend to be a front stabber, right? And you need some front stabbers. <laughs> It, you you got to have some front stabbers in your business, uh, I, and you know there, otherwise. There's a couple of phrases I'm really going to pull from this panel <laughs> moving forward. Yeah, but, but it, it, you know, you just got to have it because otherwise, you know, your mom is not a valid focus group, and <laughs> and you've just got to to really go out there and, and figure things out. So then when you're ready to come, you know, you're ready to really start talking to a more broad audience, you've already stubbed your toe a little bit. You don't, you don't wanna do your first media interview on Good Morning America, right? Let's maybe go to the Fort Collins, Colorado to start out. And that, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see from a public facing issue that I end up having to coach my way through a lot. Great. I have one last question for you guys and then I'm coming to y'all, so be ready. Um, this is about not falling into the 70% failure death trap that exists for companies. What would you say is the number one thing you would tell an entrepreneur don't do? Start a company. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Too late. <laughs> so... I, I wouldn't necessarily say don't do any one thing. I think that's the spirit of an entrepreneur is to find the thing that no one's doing and go do that thing. Um, and I think that's the beauty um, and the brutality of entrepreneur entrepreneurship. Um, but one thing that I have uh, learned uh, over the past, uh, certainly the past year, is understand that there is a cost to money. 
Right. So uh, you the ways that you bring money into the business is through revenue, uh, through loans or through some sort of investment funding. Right. So angel or private equity or venture capital. And and when we're talking with our entrepreneurs, I I spend a lot of time asking them to think through about the different costs of money. So revenue, as I, as I kind of shared earlier, it's not just about driving revenue. There is a cost to that. You have to grow your infrastructure. You have to grow your team. You have to spend money um, that to, to fulfill whatever it is that you've just sold. Um, and then from a loan standpoint, you have interest rates or potentially closing costs or whatever that looks like. And then I think about early stage investing. And, um, you know, I love our investment community. Obviously, I'm, I'm grateful for them. They've done great work. But I see a lot of entrepreneurs rush to raise money before maybe they needed to. And um, if you raise money before you need to, you're not going to have as attractive terms. And so I've seen too many entrepreneurs rush to raise funding and they give up half of their company. And if this thing takes off and it scales, let's just say you start from nothing and you grow to 10 million, well, that first 100,000, 500,000, it's costing you 5 million bucks. I mean, if you would have just taken a loan, you wouldn't have spent that kind of money. And so that's something that I, I really wanna encourage the entrepreneurs in the room, think about the proper way to deploy capital. What's your strategy? How much do you need? When do you need it? And do you really need to take on investment funding right now? Can you drive revenue? Can you delay um, you know, your phase two roadmap items? You know, what can you do to be strategic about what type of financing you're taking on and when? So if you exit or if you decide to, to pivot, you're set up in a better way. Um, it's your idea, it's your execution. You're the one who took the risk to start it. You need to get the payout. And that's, that's just my encouragement more than anything. Okay. Amen. Um, other than don't fall in love with your own product idea without finding a way to validate it, whether it's lean startup principles, the audience first thing I'm talking about, um, tied into that, I'd say, don't do it for the money alone. Do it for a sense of purpose or meaning. And if you can take that audience idea and build what amounts to a movement around something meaningful to you, whether you have a product idea or not, you'll figure it out and that'll be a home run and you'll make lots of money, but your head was in the right place. Because man, money is great, but it's not going to keep you going when it gets hard and it's going to be hard. So. Okay. I'll give my serious answer now. Um, <laughs> definitely start a company. Um, but. And I want to build on Brian a little bit. I, I was speaking at, at CU a few months ago and, you know, you know kind of going through the class. There's a, a group about this size and a kid raised his hand and I said, yeah, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to, I want to do what you do. I want to start my own company because I'm going to be my own boss. And I said, oh, son, <laughs> come here. <laughs> let's, let's um, a moment. I said, I sent out 56 invoices last month. I have 56 bosses. And I have 13 people who work for me, so I got another 13 bosses on top of that, right? You, this is not, if you're starting a company because you just are enamored with the startup life or you don't want to work for anybody, you, and Brian's unemployable is a tongue-in-cheek move, but, but you, if you are going to have a company that takes money from other people in exchange for a product or service, you're going to have bosses. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good thing because that's going to tell you if you're successful or not. So just you know, know that you're doing it because you can do it better than anybody, you've got a great idea, and you're willing to serve customers. What one thing I would say is, I think as entrepreneurs, you have you have a big ego, and you think you're the smartest person in the room. And if you run your company that way, that you're the smartest person in the room, you're only able to scale as much as you time that you have and ability to dedicate to your company that you have. Mm -hmm. Really great leaders surround themselves with people that are smarter than they are in their particular field of expertise, and. You know, if you think that I had 20 people or, you know, even 10 people that were smarter than me and we were all working as hard, you know, you're 10 times or 20 times further ahead just from a, a volume perspective. So don't, don't be the smartest person in the room. Surround yourself with really smart people. 
So I'll steal from a couple of those uh, and then it'll be a two-parter. Uh, don't ignore your data. Um, I'd say track things. Don't try to track everything, but track what's important. Track it early and often and be able to speak to what is impacting movement in those figures. And if you're not that person, uh, it's not your strength and you're not at a point where it's time to bring on a finance person, contract an outside CFO, a CPA who can work with you, look at that, track that and speak to it, especially when you need to go sit down with investors, bankers and be able to answer their questions, which are going to be very specific and detailed about line items in your financials. Um, you need to be able to do that and do not be overly optimistic and that ties into this, be optimistic Believe in your success, but one of the things we do, at least within my organization, every time we model our financials, we model a best case, worst case, and most likely have a reserve fund, a rainy day fund for your worst case scenario because you do not want to not be able to make payroll, have to go back to your investors, or call your banker when you can't do that. Great. All right, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, and since I'm the next speaker, I get to decide when we stop, so it'll be great. Um, who has a question out there for the panel? Yep. Uh, this one is for um, Since you are in the uh, development space, you are very high in data, and you um, also were referring to how I'm collecting that data. Yeah, great question. So um, from our perspective, to develop a product, we don't really need a lot of uh, data. What we really like to do is just speak with our entrepreneur, get, in a, get a sense of the product that you want to build. Um, but for us, um, w if we go to help our entrepreneurs find access to investors, either angel or VC, um, we really push hard on them to make sure the data points they do have are surrounding product market fit. So that's just taking like a, if you have like a clickable wireframe or something like that, taking that, getting feedback from the market on that. Um, so product market fits a key thing. Um, marketing, what's your go-to-market strategy? Like what Doyle was saying, it doesn't work to just show up one day and be like, oh, I'm out of stealth mode, let's talk about me now. You need to have a strategy in place ahead of time, and you need to have uh, forecasts, budgets, projections uh, tied back to marketing, tied back to your development costs, and then you need to have your legal structure of your business in place. So really from designing an initial product from a development perspective, I mean, that's the easiest part in my mind, and, and that could be because we do that every day, um, but the other data points that surround your business, I think are kind of the gotchas that, that we see our entrepreneurs run into. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay, great. Great. So you're early startup mode, you're service oriented consultant. You've got a really good team and you're pretty confident that that team is going to get the first stuff done. You do a good job. You work with a guy like Doyle and people are finding out about you and they're, they're knocking on your door, but then too many people start knocking on the door and you're trying to make that decision point, because especially when you're talking about the like, burnout point. You're making a decision point which means we've got the team, and you know, if we stop and train up the next batch of people so that we can start saying yes to more people, because we don't want to get the mode of saying no, and suddenly nobody comes back on the door. Where is that point? You know, that, that's a, that, it, it seems that's a scary point for us right now, is that we recognize that we're going to build their stuff up right now and do the work, but we also recognize that we don't want to get in the habit of saying no too soon, but we don't want to say yes too often where we're not ready. So how do we how do we balance that out? Okay. So a, a couple of things. That's that's a really scary you know place to be because you know business is coming, or at least you have good indicators of that. But you don't want to get too far over your skis. I, I really think that's a leap of faith, uh, and you you kind of just have to go for it if you're you know if that's what your 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 plan is to, to grow. Um, I, I really think you do need to bring on that those people and get them trained up so that you're you're ready for that next wave. And I think from a recruiting perspective, you should always be recruiting. You know, it's not just uh, I 
you know, I recruited and now I'm going to take six months break and then I'm going to go start recruiting again. You should always be recruiting. You should always have a talent pipeline that you're working with and you're just making connections. You may not need them for six months or three months, but when that time comes and a lot of times that's just, hey, my phone rang three times, four times. Uh oh, what am I going to do? you've already got those people in place that you can call on. But, but I do think it's, it's a little bit of a leap of faith that you have to say, I, I'm, I, I believe in what I'm doing and I know the growth is gonna come even if I, don't, you know, I can't see specifically who that is yet. You just have to trust it. It's scary though. One, one thing I'll add on too is, and, and I'm a little bit further ahead than you guys are, but I, I brought in a sales coach about two years ago who moved my sales funnel from a really Sometimes I looked at it, Google spreadsheet, to an actual software program. I happen to use one called PipeDrive. It's like Salesforce, but smaller and cheaper and free. Well, not quite free, but darn close. But now I can look at it and say, from the time that I get to this, you know, a client calls and says hi, till the time I'm at yes or no, I've got enough data now to go, that's about 66 days. I can, I can look at some things. So back to Amanda's point of data, to the degree that you can start to build those things in and get some some free or really cheap tools to do that, it's going to help you make those decisions of if this, then that. Because otherwise, like Chuck says, you're kind of just going, it feels like we're really busy. I should hire somebody. And they might not close. So, so can I add? So one last thing. Uh, where we got into trouble, we're also a services-based business, is I wanted to hire in advance of need is what was my favorite phrase. Um, that's expensive. <laughs> Um, because if deals don't <laughs> close, you have to maintain the bench, Chuck's right? Over yeah. Here. So. You're the has to say, you're a really nice person, but. Oh, God. That is the worst. It's thing. the worst feeling in the world. This whole like hire slow, fire fast thing, just hire very slowly and and avoid the pain of having to let someone go. But I would say this, I I never say no. I just can't. It's again probably the revenue driver in me. So what I'd rather do is maintain a pipeline of people that I can hire on short notice. And how I've done that is I've invested a lot of time in networking. Um, I'll meet anybody for coffee. I'll talk to them about their career goals. I've invested a lot of time in establishing my employment brand and what we what it's like to work for Appit. And so I, I have that. And then on my team side, we have a practice that we call Red Dot. So uh, the red dot is kind of like where you are in the mall. You know, if you go to the mall map and it says you're here. So the red dot, that's what it means. And so you say personal and professional. Red means I'm good. Yellow means I'm okay, kind of treading water. Red means I'm not good. And so if I see my team broken out by service provider, if they're at red, and my, my own internal thing is if I've got two weeks of red on the professional side, I'm going to bring in somebody new. Um, and that's, that's just how I've built my practice because I can't say no. Um, it's expensive to say no. Yeah. Um, so I have a counterpoint to that. Um, my first three businesses were client-based uh, service businesses and uh, I was really good at marketing and really bad at managing them. So the shift I made in 2005 was no more clients ever. And, and never do anything I'm not good at. So it sounded like before I did everything, but I only did what I was good at. And everyone else, all the 65 other people did all their jobs and it was fantastic. But when I had the service businesses, because the pipeline was always full, that wasn't the problem. I love saying no. Because when you say no, you get the best clients who pay you the most money. Uh, retainer versus one-offs. I mean, I just use that and it's marketing position, right? So if you're good at marketing and you've got the, the blessing of having more people than you can handle, then pick the ones you don't want. It's wonderful. So that's just yeah. a different perspective, but I also hated clients and she doesn't, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I am gonna give us one last question and then we are gonna open up the bar and the food and carry on with the rest of this. So, Kurt. Yeah. 
Thank you. Great question. So first thing, I hired a fractional CFO, um, and he's really helped me improve my financial liter literacy in a short period of time. Um, so he's he's done a lot for my business. Um, and the cool thing is about brilliant people like that is they bring with them other brilliant people. Um, so we have a unique business, how we're structured. We're an international business. And so um, he's brought about tax consultants and compliance consultants on the international level that have really helped us be strategic about how we're deploying capital in our business. So that's that's been huge for me. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to call out, um, her name is Alicia Huck. She's kind of, she's well known in, in Denver. She's an operations consultant and um, she has helped our team with operational excellence. So, um, building out the infrastructure, so systems, processes, actually meeting structure really matters. Um, and she's helped me get very clear about, as a leader, what are the 10 things I need to know about the health of my business every single day? And can I get that data by pulling up a dashboard or a report, or do I need to run around and ask a bunch of people? And so she's really been powerful in helping me um, instill some discipline within the organization and getting very specific about what I need from who and when. And so those are kind of my two biggies right now is um, Alicia and, um, and my fractional CFO. And um, you know, I don't know who said it, but as you're scaling, you find more issues that come up. Um, those are the people I call when I don't know what to do. Um, and so just that, that perspective from the outside. You know, you can't see the label from inside the bottle. And so these are the people I trust to front stab me because um, I pay them to do that. So <laughs> so there's that. I guess I would just say find your, we all have a skill, right? It's either driving revenue, it's management of people, it's management of numbers, it's operations. It's, it's We all have a very particular skill. Find out which one you don't have and hire the best in the business to support you and teach you. So, great. I want to say thank you to all of you um, because all of you either came up from Boulder or Denver and it is infrequent that we find people are willing to drive this far north on I-25. So we really do appreciate that very much. <laughs>